Happy Father's Day. Come on, let's give God the glory. In 1908, the first father, uh, Father's Day ceremony was held in a, a church in West Virginia, a Methodist church. A young lady was actually grieving over her father, and so they had what they called a Father's Day ceremony. Two years later, in a place called Spokane, Washington, a lady by the name of Sonora Smart Dodd, she said, I believe that my dad has done such a great job that this should be almost a national holiday. And so she pushed. And in 2000, I'm, I'm sorry, in 1910, we got this day, dads. We got the day where some of us get a chance to sleep in. Some of us get that famous necktie over and over again. We get those socks. And, and it's just a beautiful time when we get a chance to acknowledge each other, our dads, and so on and so on. And so today, as we go through the service, I want to speak to you dads and those dads to be about fatherhood. And I believe that God is going to show us something today that will allow us to help heal this nation. Right around 1450 B.C., a guy by the name of Moses is writing what you and I now call Genesis. And, and he sets the order for family in the second chapter and the 24th verse. He tells us for this cause, a man is going to leave his father, he's going to leave his mother, and he's going to cleave to his wife. He sets the order for family in the correct way. A man, a woman coming together in holy matrimony. Well, this nation has finally got on board with that vision. We've been studying fatherhood programs around the nation, and now we've just gotten to a place where we're doing some, some real research-based studies on these fatherhood programs. We now have evidence-based curriculums that we produce, uh, that we actually minister to uh, individuals that want to be involved in fatherhood. And one of the main pieces that they're studying right now is the tandem family, how it relates to a married couple versus just a couple living in the home. And they are seeing a different type of result. They're looking at these studies because the nation has been faced with the gripping decline in men being able to carry out their duties and responsibilities. They're also looking at the data, the performances and outcomes of these youth and, and uh, 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 some adult individuals that are involved in our uh, social system. They found out that 71% of all teenage pregnant young ladies live in a home where the dad is not there. They found out even on, in the area of behavioral disorders that 85% of all of the individuals that exhibit extreme behavioral disorders are in homes where dads are not there. Now, they estimate that, that and of course, we don't know the numbers uh, for sure, but they estimate that there are 70 million dads in the nation right now. 24,000 homes are without those dads. And so they started to focus on this. We wanted to get, and I'll show you some uh, slides and uh, a little bit of data in, in a second. Uh, they wanted to start targeting a population that they thought was most vulnerable to, to um, maybe going astray as it related to fatherhood. And so they uh, came up with this, uh, um, this group between the ages of 16 and 24. Now, those studies were not available when I first became got involved in uh, National Initiative for Fatherhood. But they fell right on par with the classes that we actually got a chance to teach. 
And so we now know where the most critical areas are. We're looking at all of the assessment data that we need to be able to produce it. But here's something cool you might want to know. Guess what they found out? That the Word of God was right. That, to, that the way to administer a fatherhood program was to include Christ Jesus. How about that? And so I, I'm, I'm proud to say that these fatherhood programs are, are in effect. There are many of them that I don't know about. There's some that I do. I've worked in conjunction with all of the fatherhood programs in this area, at least most of them. Um, I do have an office inside of Department of Social Services where we do fatherhood programming there, and we also do, of course, prison ministry and a number of other services that we render to the community. So we get a firsthand look at this. I had a meeting last uh, week, a tri-county meeting with a, a number of individuals. Uh, Brent Atwater, if you, any of you are in the child support system and you want to know about fatherhood, of course, in New Life, you know, none of you guys are in jeopardy of child support. Um, if you were, you'd be leaving now. Um, but, but, but we, you know, Brett Atwater is the place, is a person to see, and I need to give you that information because this is real time stuff. Um, if you're involved in Head Start programs, then Simeon Russell is the person to see. And uh, we run our programs inside, outside. We run them on the, uh, uh, the county level. We also run them on the state level inside of the uh, penal systems. Now, uh, Catherine Foundation actually sponsors our program. So all of our books go to, uh, come from Catherine Foundation. The stipends come from Catherine, Catherine Foundation. So when you leave here today... Make sure you stop at one of the booths and pick up one of those little cards because if you're a dad in here that's in need of services, we want you to grab that card and give us a call. And when I say in need of service, it could be anything, anything that may be hindering you from being that good father that you really want to be. We don't, you know, there are a number of things that we could talk about. We could talk about the, uh, the, the health Piece. There's, there's a, a heavy a piece in there about health, men, us just paying attention to who we are. Um, there's, of course, the substance abuse pieces in there as well. Um, there's a lot about mental health. There's a lot about, you know, just, it's just a, 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 a bunch of components in there that you, you might want to look at. So when you leave here today, or maybe you might know someone who might need the service or wants want to be involved in it, make sure you go out and grab one of those little uh, flyers from the Catherine Foundation. The other thing I want to touch on is Pastor Aaron talked about the uh, shootings in, uh, in South Carolina. So guess what your church is going to do? Your church is going to hold a prayer vigil right over at the Dome, 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. And we need to get together. First of all, we're one in the body of Christ, and that's what I love about new life. Amen? I, um, I, I've, I've only had one profound statement in my life, so let me see if I can quote it. There is no one race that has cornered the market on ignorance. Amen? So as we, as we uh, begin to process this situation, it's not going to be a racial thing. It's about us understanding that People do bad things, and it doesn't matter what race they are. As I was uh, studying my history, did you know that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's mom was shot in a church in, in 1974, and she was shot by a black man? You have to understand that, that, that there's no racial boundaries when it comes to stupidity. And so when we come together on, on Tuesday night, we're going to pray, and we're going to acknowledge those fathers uh, I'm, uh, well, yes, those fathers and, and moms and those that, are, uh, those that were um, victimized by it, it traumatically, uh, an experience of people now might not feel like going to church. I remember when I was in the, uh, when I was in the world, um, I remember uh, a couple of times I had gone to nightclubs. If you're from D.C., you remember a place called Eastside. So I went to the nightclub, and they had a shooting there. And that never stopped us from going back next week, you know? <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't mean that to be funny, but it is, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we want to pray that those that have experienced, uh, you know, some, some trauma, that it doesn't turn them off from going to the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 
All right. So I um so so I always get with heavy heavy brains when it comes to writing a sermon. All right. So if you'll put these, uh, we, you don't have any points today. You have a search word puzzle. You, all right, yeah. So I got with some very heavy, heavy brains, people that study the Bible and know what's happening. I went to my daughter, 15 years old. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, hey, give me a couple of attributes. Give me five attributes of a good father. She said, okay. So she gives me this, forgiving, generous, patient, compassionate, and loving. So I looked at her. I said, couldn't you think of something that I possessed? <laughs> so, so on your bulletin, you'll see that you have a cross-search puzzle. I'm not sure what we call it, but you have this cross-search puzzle. And so fill this in. You know, find all those attributes that you have Fill that in. And I'm going to, to, to just wake you up, just, just wake you up just a little bit with some information on what's happening in the real world as it relates to fathers not doing what they're supposed to do. Now, moms, I know that you're doing your best. So this, this video, first of all, it's not going to come to fruition in your household because we're going to pray at the end of this service, and make sure God is in this place. Amen? But, but I want you to know that this is not about you. This is about the God that didn't do what he was supposed to do. And so I don't want any moms walking away feeling like, oh, this is going to happen to my child just because dad's not there. No, no, God's going to cover that home. I'm telling you that right now. I'm a guy that I never met my biological father. And I was surprised that that bothered me even up to now. I'm 55 years old. I, it still bothers me. But let me just tell you, God has somebody in my life that taught me the right thing. And I didn't always do the right thing, but I have a father. And so I am excited to bring you this fatherhood message because it's something that I totally believe in. Let's look at those numbers now. We're going to pray those numbers down tonight. Amen. Tonight, we're going to bring those numbers down. T today, I'm sorry. We're going to bring those numbers down in the name of Jesus. In 1994, a guy by the name of Don er Eberly brought his data to the White House. And he launched this program called the National Fatherhood Initiative. The part of the program that we like most was inside outside dad 24 7 why because it allowed us to tell people about jesus christ yeah. it's a program where we get a chance to talk about our lord and savior and so we all across the nation we rejoiced in the fact that we could finally initiate these programs and and not be fearful of the establishment saying whoa you can't talk about jesus Guess what? They finally got to a place where they knew that only God could help us. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Would you go with me to the 15th chapter of Luke? Some of you all, you have your Bibles with you. If you have your electronic device, would you uh, turn there? 
We're going to look at our doctor according to Colossians uh, 4.15. Uh, Paul refers to Luke as this, physici- this physician. He's our doctor. He's the only Gentile that's going to write in the New Testament. He has two books he rolls out to us. Uh, one is named after himself, and then the other is Acts. And right around 60 A.D., he records these parables that Jesus Christ had given to a group of tax collectors and sinners. And so this first chapter, this uh, 15th chapter, the first thing you'll see is you'll see something called the lost sheep. These areas is divided in three parts. And so you see the first thing there is the lost sheep, and it talks about how if one of us left or one of our sheep got away from us, we leave a whole 99 of them just to go back to get that one. So it just shows us God's love. So so this is a parable, and I'm going to talk about the, the, the parable in a more literal sense, but I want you to know that this is Jesus give, rolling out some parables to those that he's talking to. Now, the second part of that chapter, divide, subdivided again, um, he talks about the lost coin. And so what it does is it tells us if, you know, if you had $10 and you lost one of those dollars, you would search for that $1 just like you would the, the other nine that I left. So it gives us a perspective as to how the Lord feels about us as when, when we walk away from here. Walk, I'm sorry, walk away from him. But now, when you get down to the 11th verse, you will see that it says, the lost son. Whoa, you know, first when he says sheep, you know, you're not worried about sheep because none of us are herding sheep or anything like that. You just look at it. It's just a good story. Then you get down to the money, you say, whoa, 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 okay, I'm going to pay attention to this. And then you finally get to a part of this chapter where you can relate. One of us leaving the fold. And so in verse 11, remember, it says this, and Jesus continued. So that's one of the reasons we want to cover those first two items, the lost sheep and the lost coin, because this is a continuation of Jesus giving parables. He says, there was a man that had two sons. The younger son said to his father, father, give me my share of the inheritance. He uses the word a statement. I want you to think about this as I have to put you in mind of, of how this works, okay? Now, the, the Bible tells us, uh, Proverbs 20, 21 tells us that an inheritance given too soon or taken too soon will come to no good. But, but I want to put you in mind of what happened. The Bible says, so his father divided the property between them. Asking for your inheritance in the days of old was like saying to your father, you wished he was dead. Now, Deuteronomy has a formula, uh, the 21st chapter and the 17th verse, has a formula for how uh, an, inher- an inheritance is divided uh, to a young man. So we, we estimate that this young man was entitled to one-third of his father's inheritance. But the sheer nerve of him asking for the inheritance before his father died was an insult. So this is the time when I'm going to relate to you, all right? So let's just take your son, um, that nice guy, Junior. And and Junior comes to you, you're over at Washington Hospital Center, you're trying to recover from a stroke or, you know, you're going through cancer or something like that, and Junior shows up, hey, Dad, don't look like you're going to make it anyway. How about I get the house now? (laughs) 
That's, that's, what it was, that's what it was like to ask for your inheritance before your parents was gone. Think about it. What if that really happened? One of your sons came to you, Dad, Dad, oh, I can use the car while it's nice and new. And look, you ain't going to be around long. You know, you're about to check out of here. Hey, why don't you let me get the car now? Can you imagine what, I mean, Pastor Mike would have to visit every home of every dad in here because there would probably be some problems at those homes. All you nice dads, I mean, you know. Because that's not the way it works. I mean, you're putting that estate aside. You're putting that inheritance aside so when you leave that they will be comfortable. And so this young man, he asked for his inheritance. But look, the, the dad says, I'm going to divide my property between you all. You know what I got from that? The dad didn't fight him. I came to understand that what was said to me in that verse was, dads, sometimes we got to let them go. Jesus give, is giving this parable. He's saying, hey, this is the actions of a good father. He says the son, the younger son comes and says, hey, dad, I want to get my money now. They said the dad doesn't fight when we say, okay, I'm dividing my property up. Now, y'all know we wouldn't have done that. What I would have divided for him is stuff that I can't say right now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, but, but do you see what, what I'm saying? This father had wisdom. He was smarter than I am. He had wisdom. He knew that sometimes you got to give these children an opportunity to mess up. We, we, don't, have a, we don't have control over them. That's what was said to me as I read that. You know, you, at some point, you got to take your hands off of them. You see, uh, the, the definition that I like, uh, uh, Strong's Transliteration 3962 for dad is patera. It is P-A-T-E-R. Uh, it is the founder of the family. It's the guy that understands how important the life of the family is, and so they do things in a long-term order. Sometimes you got to let them hurt. So he allows this young man to, to, to go off with his estate. The Bible says that he goes away to a distant land. I mean, he goes far away. And, 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 and he, when he gets there, he squanders all of his money. I mean, he just blows it all on riotous living. He takes good money and sows it into bad activity. The, the Bible calls that, or the, the Greek transliteration, uh, Strong's uh, 811 is asotos, A-S-O-T-O-S. It is when you take good money and sow it into reckless living. When you read the 30th chapter, I'm sorry, the 30th verse of this chapter, his brother actually tells what he spent the money on, prostitutes. So now, I'm just painting this picture so that we can all be on the same page so you guys can know why I'm so mad. Okay, you worked hard. You've worked 20 years with your good government job, you get, put a little money away for your child. Here comes Junior, is what we call him. And Junior says, hey, Dad, I want to get my money now. You give him the money. He goes off. He squanders the money on prostitutes. Can I give you the Greek definition of that? Because I know uh, earlier, I think they got mad with me. Greek definition of spending your money on prostitutes. That's buying booty. I don't have a strong transliteration for you. <laughs> see, see, it's sometimes your kids mess up the money and you understand it. You know, maybe they, you know, maybe they buy a house that's, you know, too much. But you kind of understand, you know, the American dream. Or maybe they buy a car that, you know, that's, that costs too much. And you just say, okay, Junior, you messed up again. Let me show you, you know. And, and then you start talking to them about S&P funds, I don't know all this stuff, but, you know, all that stock market stuff that they talk about. 
And you say, okay, well, you know, hey, you, you, you just took a loss. You know, stocks are like that. But when the child calls you and says, hey, look, Dad, I just wasted money on that Greek word that Pastor John talked about. It's hard to forgive them. Do you know what this chapter is all about? This chapter is about a father that knows how to forgive. This is about how God forgives us when we make mistakes. And for us fathers, we have to come into a oneness with this message. What is the fatherhood program all about? Doing everything that you can, while you can, for those that need you. That's really what it's all about. I'd like it. I'll put it to you this way. Um, David lives a beautiful life for the most part. Um, he, he reigns right around 1010 all the way up to 970 uh, B.C. Um, somewhere in between there, he has this praise team. There's a guy by the name of Asaph uh, in charge of the symbols. He is, he is David's personal prophet. He writes in Psalms 82, 3. You know what he tells us? He tells us that we should defend the weak and the fatherless. He tells us that we should be standing up for the causes of the poor and the oppressed. Hey, nobody did that better than a guy by the name of David, uh, uh, 2 Samuel, uh, the ninth chapter. Do you read where he rescued a guy by the name of Mephibosheth? He, he, went, to, he went to the house of Makur. He says, hey, I'm going to get Jonathan's children. He did it. I, I, I have some pictures, I, you know, I know I'm not, you know, a prolific as David, but, you know, sometimes when I'm out there on the streets and I'm giving the gospel of Jesus Christ, I feel like I'm doing a good thing. I mean, I love, no, I mean, who, you can't replace this. This is beautiful, getting a chance to talk to you all and, and you know, come up on the platform. But actually, I want to tell you, if you ever want to see me preach, you got to follow me Monday through Friday because my preaching is not done on this platform. I want to show you something, a couple of guys that I had the opportunity to bring this message to about fatherhood. There we are. This is one of the graduating classes. These, um, everybody except for two of these guys, they fall in that 16 to 24-year-old percentile for fatherhood program. That's where the uh, most critical need is, and this is one of our graduating classes. I couldn't get my picture straight. I was actually looking for my very first class, but I couldn't show you all of them because we actually graduated 82 participants. Amen? Give God the glory. Um, so this one, this one's on a uh, county level, and then I just took one, brought one in because I'd be here all day. The next one is on the state level. Um, you, you see the, the warden here, our chaplain at uh, Calvert County Detention Center, yours truly, an, an individual that didn't even know he needed the skills until he entered the class. You know, most people say, oh, I'm a good father. I'm a good father. I mean, you know, I mean, who am I? I'm, I can't argue with you if you say you're a good dad. Um, but one of the things that we taught him specifically was when you call home, because he, he's incarcerated, when you call home, don't try to be the disciplinary. Right now, you're not in a position to tell him, don't do anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. <laughs> The only, thing you, you can, the only thing you can do right now is support. The only thing you can do now is say, hey, I love you. That's what the fatherhood program taught him. And guess what? When he made his phone calls home, he began to change his structure. Instead of calling home saying, oh, I heard you did this wrong. I heard you did, do that wrong. He took some good advice. And the advice that we gave him was, right now, you're not in the position to be that part of your son. You've been in and out of prison all of your life. Right now, what I want you to do is tell them how much you love them. And so we were excited about that. We've, we've launched the program. I don't know if I have any other pictures. I can't remember. Is that, is that it? Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I just wanted to say this. The name of, of course, the name of this ser sermon is Better Men, Better Dads. But it's never too late. And this is actually, I didn't explain this to the other um, congregations, uh, 
services. This is actually a man who has life in prison. That's why I put that there. He's never coming home again. So I, I, I said, you know, in, in talking to him, hey, guess what? There's a way for God to use you here. See, you have to understand that God doesn't make any mistakes. And a lot of people think because I do prison ministry that I want everybody to come home. No, no. I don't want, no, I don't want anybody to rape my wife. I don't want anybody to rape your wife. And if they haven't learned their lesson, jail's not a bad place for people that belong there. So I'm, I'm not soft on crime. But I will tell you this, if you look at your stats, you'll see that most of them are coming home, whether you like it or not. I just want them to prepare. That's what it's all about. Amen? But this young man, that young man there, he's not coming home. He does have a, a, a life, sen- uh, life sentence of uh, a, a felonious mer- murder, so he's not coming home anytime soon. But guess what? He understands the value of Christianity. He is telling other inmates about Christ Jesus. He's telling other people how God can change their lives, and he's being the best father that he can possibly be. Is that what it's all about? Amen. Amen. Let's give God the glory. So this young man, he goes off to this land, and he does anything that he wants to do. I mean, he just spends up all the money, and then he begins to think. He goes out into a field to feed the pigs because there's a famine in the land. He spent up all the money. This famine takes place. And and that's, you know, well, I'm going to give you another Greek word in a minute. He he spent up all the money, and he was a (laughs) B-R-O-K-E. Again, I don't have the strongest transliteration for you on that one. He spent up all the money. He was broke. And the Bible said there was a famine in the land. Can I just tell you what a famine is? Because to us, you're just thinking, oh, well, nobody's eating this, that, and the other. No, a famine was the worst economical depression that you could actually go through because the, the, everything depended on the crops. Everything was agriculture back then. Everything was livestock. So you had the, 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 the cows that would die. You'd have you know, the horses that weren't able to, 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 uh, to do what they needed to do, the, the donkeys, your oxen. Everything would die. It said there was a severe, in fact, read your Bible. It says it was a severe famine in the land. And so all of a sudden, This guy, he came to his senses. The the word is a-k-a, a-k-a. He came to his senses. You know what it is? It's the touch. It's the smell. It's the hearing. It's the seeing. Strong's transliteration uh, 189 gives it to us. It is nothing but summarizing reality. He got to a place where he was desperate. He got to a place where he didn't have a choice. And he began to think about his father's house. Read with me in verse 17, I believe. Verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Now watch this, 18. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I don't know if anybody caught that. He was rehearsing his line. Of course, you guys never did anything wrong. I I know this congregation. I've been here before. Nothing but saints here. Um, But but you can remember the other guy that did something wrong. So just, just indulge me, as they say in court. And you, you've done something wrong, really, really bad. And you're trying to figure out a way to be accepted back. What do you do? You start rehearsing. You say, oh, oh I know what I'm going to say. 
I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, um, baby, you, you were right. Because, you know, everybody likes to hear that you, you messed up. When you mess up, they want to hear you say it, right? Uh, so you say, um, hey, baby, I want you to know that I was, I was wrong and you were right. So that's the first part of the plan. So you kind of, you know you're in there when you say that, right? Because she can't wait to hear that. And then you say, and you know what? From now on, you're going to make promises. You you start to make a promise. You say, from now on, I'm going to do this. And now on, I'm going to do that. And blah, 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 blah. Rehearsing your line. So this guy does the same thing. Just goes to show you the game hasn't changed. This guy does the same thing. He says, Dad... You know what? I'm sorry. I sinned against heaven and I sinned against earth. Earth. And you, you know how when you do something wrong, you, you kind of, then you start praying to God. Every, everybody would do something wrong and you want forgiveness, you turn into a preacher. You know, like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Ooh, I hear you. You know what I mean? All of a sudden, you just, you just get so spiritual. Oh, God, forgive me. And guess what? This guy When he decides to go home, his dad is a forgiving man. His dad, the Bible says, his dad sees him from afar off. Now, I want you to think about this because we're still talking about Junior again, right? So Junior, he's gone out. He spent all of the money. He's on his way back home. You see him from afar. Now, most of you all would be like this. Yeah, I knew he would come back. (laughs) And you you waiting there because, you know, you got some form. You got a whole lot of stuff you plan on saying. That, that's not what happened here. The Bible says that the dad runs out to him. He says he sees him from afar. He runs out to him. He doesn't even give him a chance to get home. You know, come on, dads. Then you know you will make him walk all the way up to that step. <laughs> right? And you might, you might have stood there with the screen door locked. <laughs> Right? You might like, yes, can I help you? <laughs> but no, not this dad. This dad said, that's my son. I still love him. Amen. That's what God does to us. Amen. He doesn't put us through any changes and hoops and all that kind of stuff. You know, only people do that kind of stuff is, is church people. Church people do that kind of stuff. Oh, you was over there. I've been in this church for 10 years. Who do you think you are supposed to be coming? That's what church people do. Do you know that's the reason I didn't want to get involved in this business? I loved it on the street because they were so genuine. They admitted that they were who they were. Boy, when you got inside the church, oh, they were all prim and proper. Praise the Lord. I said, did that come out of your mouth or your ear? <laughs> and they have established protocol. You know, y'all been to some of them churches where, you know, like the pastors, the, the, you know, I mean, the pastors like almost like God in some of these places. They got these big cheers. Oh, y'all, y'all seen those cheers? They had it like these big cheers and everybody be like all over the, eh, this is a pastor's birthday. It's the pastor's birthday. It's the pastor's birthday. It's the pastor's birthday. <laughs> I'm like, what? It's a pat that birthday. See, that kind of stuff make me mad. So, so I just went out and told people about Jesus. They wanted to hear about it. I was on the corner of 9th and F Street, Northwest. I wasn't trying to do anything but tell people about Jesus. I wasn't thinking about four walls because I figured everybody inside, of, they had everything together. I was even scared to bring the stats. I was shivering. I was like, oh, they might not like this. Oh, they might like like this. I'm thinking to myself, you know, uh, I did a seminar last week. I did a seminar. I was talking to one of the pastors. I start, I start, you know, of course, me, I start rolling out my child support numbers, right? Because there's $6 billion of unpaid child support. And the pastor told me, he said, well, we probably won't need that here at our church. I say, everybody up to date on their child support? You know, I just do what I do. I mean, I, you know, I don't have no degree in this stuff. I only li- read the Bible because I love God. I'm not reading it because I'm trying to get a grade. I, I tell you right now, I probably fail every class that they give me. I read the Bible because I want to live it. I'm probably never going to get some kind of degree in it. But you know what? That is so far away from my mission in Christ. I just want to tell people about Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Let's talk about this guy. 
This father says, put a robe on him. He accepts him back. He accepts him back with the family robe. You know, this is the robe of excellency. This is the robe of royalty. He says, I want him back. I want him restored. You know what else he tells him? He says, quick. He said, go get me a ring. You know what he's talking about? The, the family insignia. He's talking about, about the ring that shows that he has authority in that family. He didn't say, okay, you got to get in line now. You lost your CRD. You can't bake cookies. <laughs> you got to go through the pastor's training. And you didn't show up at the pastor's birthday. At the pastor's birthday. <laughs> Ain't you sick? I'm just sick of this mess. I'm just sick of it. God has called us to do something great, but we keep hindering him with all our rules and regulations. Amen? This guy had it right. There's there's a couple of passages here. Um, uh, Proverbs 22.6, train up a child in the way that he would go, and when he is old, he will not depart. But I'm reminded of a passage that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. Right around 53 AD, Paul is headed home from the second missionary journey. On his way, he plants a church. We call that church Ephesus. He heads to Jerusalem. He stays there for a while. And then he heads back to Ephesus where he resides for three years. And then he leaves there. Right around 60 AD, he's in a Roman prison. And he writes that church. Ephesians 6, 4. Look what he tells us, Dad. Us dads. He says, provoke not your children to anger. You know, you know how he finishes that chapter? He tells us to raise them up in the admonition of of the Lord. This dad was our model. He went, this this son went out and spent his money on illicit living. I mean, don't get it wrong. It wasn't just prostitution. It was all types of things. And I could take you back if you're thinking, oh, well, my son's different because my son is off into the opioid thing. He's shooting heroin. He's taking pain pills. Hey, can I tell you that in the days of old, heroin was here. I could tell, I could do it, I won't do it here, but I could do a study on the poppy plant for you. And the uses of it is not new. Only thing different was different paraphernalia. But they were using it back then. This person had gone out and lived a a riotous life. But his dad was forgiving. His dad said, you're my son. I'm going to take you back. Dads, let me talk to you. As a matter of fact, all men. Let me talk to you. God has called us to do something, not only for our own children, but for those that are around us. We we have this unique opportunity to be involved with, with the Catherine Foundation point of change. I saw Roland here with this shirt. Roland, if you're in here, stand up. I can't see. I don't. Uh, Roland has a fatherhood program. Oh, there he is. Okay, there he is. Get a, get a look at that guy right there. There's another one of the fatherhood programs that you can get involved in. So, so, so we had this unique opportunity to get involved in doing something to change the lives of our people. Okay? And I know y'all think, oh, Pastor John going to invite us to a Bible study. Or maybe he's going to invite us to some place where he can hear him speak. No, no, no. We're going to meet them, those children at their need. Amen. You know, one of the things that, that um, we, were, we were able to do, and I, I, I know it's only God, um, Pastor Chris, love them. Pastor Mike, love them. They asked me, they said, hey, do you want an office here on campus? And I was like, oh, um, you know, it's, it's not where I do my work. Church, church is not where I do my work. But the director of the Department of Social Services, Therese Wolf said, would you like an office here? I said, that's where I do my work. 
And so now we have an office located in the Department of Social Services. We can get at our at-risk youth. Youth. We have a, uh, a foster care, a foster uh, youth seminar on this campus scheduled for September the 18th. It's, it's actually, I'm sorry, a symposium uh, for foster youth. They're going to be there along with parole, probation, along with all the other support systems of. of um, of those, in, of that, those individuals, we're gonna have it right over at the dome. And I'm right there where I need to be. I have an office in Calvert County Detention Center. I'm right there where I need to be. No, I'm not gonna need an office on campus. But I have one where I need to be. This is your time today to start thinking about getting involved in something that's bigger than yourself. We're going to pray for those dads today. We're going to pray for those, those, those families where the dad is not doing what he's supposed to do. And the service before this, we had men circling this entire room. I want to wrap this up. Pastor Jen I just, I just love her. She, she, after every sermon, she come, uh, come get with me and tell me what I did right and what I did wrong. <laughs> but she told me, she says, hey, you know, it would be cool to wrap up with those same letters that were, that's on the cross search puzzle. So if you would just put those up. I just want to read them. I thought that was good. And thank you, Pastor Jen. I, I, I really appreciate that. Listen, amen. Give God the glory. So, so here's what we're going to pray. As those men come up, we're going to pray that we all can be more forgiving. We're going to pray that we all will become more compassionate, generous, loving, and patient. Amen? So I'm going to give you a little direction as to how we're going to do that. They're going to put a video up. It's going to show some cool scenes about dads being together with their children. Um, I'm going to ask um, this middle section of men to go to the back. You want to go ahead and put the, you can go ahead and put the video up now. I'll ask this section of men to go to the back, and this section of men come to the front, and we're going to surround this sanctuary and have Pastor Aaron to pray for us in the area of fatherhood. Amen? Come on, men. Let's, let's go. Uh, again, that section to the back, this section around here. <laughs>